One of the most uh, heartbreaking experiences um, in the church anyways, is to watch someone who's been raised as a Christian or someone who has been a member of the church suddenly leave it. Interesting, just talking to someone before, before services tonight about that very thing that happened to a friend, I think. You know, people stop coming altogether, they just don't come anymore. Or they go to another religion it's different if they stop coming here and they go over to East Side or something, but they just go to another religion completely. Usually their church meeting time gets taken up by sports or work or, or other activities. Sometimes that's the reason. When this happens, you know, we kind of scratch our heads. We wonder how so-and-so who used to be so faithful, they used to teach Sunday school sometimes we say, you know, all of a sudden, but they stop coming. And we blame the devil and sin, or we blame the church sometimes for not doing enough for that person. Somehow we didn't do enough, or we did the wrong thing. Or we blame the person's lack of commitment or their faith. Now these may all be true, but sometimes I think the true reason that they leave is that the person was indoctrinated, but never converted. There's a big difference between being indoctrinated and being converted. A person is indoctrinated when he or she is taught to think a certain way and to respond in a certain manner. Indoctrination isn't a bad thing. It's what Solomon is talking about when he says, train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old he will not depart from it. That's indoctrination, teaching them. Indoctrination is a drill, it's practice, it's training in a set of ideas and principles that will guide your thinking and your speech and your conduct, it's a good thing. The only problem with indoctrination is that it is no substitute for conversion, only a preparation for it. Conversion, on the other hand, means to change. There's no drill or memory or work in conversion. It happens only once, and once it happens, you know. I've often said the very best thing about having been converted at the age of, in my case, at the age of 30, was that even to this day, I remember what it was like being lost. I remember what it was like walking around and doing my business and doing everything, you know, and having relationships with people and trying to make money and so on and so forth, and having no concept of God, no consideration of God in my life. That Jesus, yeah, something I learned in catechism class when I was a kid. I remember what it's like being an unspiritual person, being lost. I remember that, it's the only good thing about being converted uh, as an adult. Conversion is the end result of indoctrination. If the indoctrination bears fruit, conversion takes place. Indoctrination talks about Christianity, conversion experiences it. That's the difference. In the church, some people are well indoctrinated. I've met many. They know the information about Christianity. They can talk the lingo. You know, Christians, we have a certain lingo. They can talk the lingo of Christianity. They can go through the motions of worship and fellowship and good living. But when they are challenged by temptation or adversity or a call to a deeper commitment, they fall away because they were well indoctrinated but never really converted. Conversion is a process. And in this process, there are four areas in a person that need to change for total conversion to happen. You could say that during the sermon this evening, you are being indoctrinated in the way that a person is totally converted to Christ. So total conversion requires conversion in four areas. Number one, head conversion. Head conversion, the main difference between indoctrination and conversion is faith. 
Indoctrination is knowing and understanding and remembering and the ability to discuss and even teach others your faith. Conversion, however, requires a person to actually believe as true what it is that they have learned. There's a big difference between knowing and believing. For example, I know that there are 200 million communists in Russia, but I don't believe that they are correct in their understanding. The difference between knowing and believing. I know about abortion. I don't believe in abortion. Okay. Conversion to Christianity requires the head to change what it believes. Conversion requires that we believe some basic things. We believe that there is one God, only one God. We believe as true that statement. That's conversion. Conversion requires that we believe as true that Jesus Christ is the only Lord, the only prophet, the only savior. Conversion requires that we believe as true that we personally are sinners. Conversion requires that we believe as, as true that God has spoken through the Bible, that the Bible is God's word. Conversion requires that we believe that salvation comes through faith in Jesus Christ. We can know these things. We can know many other doctrines about Christianity, but our conversion only begins when we decide that the things we know about Christianity are indeed the truth and the only truth against which all other truth is measured. It's just not one of the truths. It's not just a good truth. It's the only truth, the true truth. So the head needs to be converted. Secondly, the heart needs to be converted. They say the longest distance in the world is the distance between the head and the heart. Many believe but they never allow what they believe to enter and convert their hearts. The heart represents the seat of the emotions and the emotions need converting because they are at the core of who we really are. Paul the Apostle was a great example of a person whose head and heart were converted by Christ. As a Pharisee, he had been indoctrinated in the law and in the Jewish traditions. He had an opinion about God and who Jesus was. As a matter of fact, a very zealous opinion which led him to persecute Christians. When he heard the gospel, he changed his mind about Jesus and who he was. That was the head change. And then he gave his life to serving him as an apostle. That was a heart change. Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, you love with your heart, not with your head. Conversion means that the object of your love has changed. Before, we loved ourselves. We love our pleasure. We love our will being done. We love people who are like us. We like our world. We like and love our goals. But you know that conversion of your heart has taken place if you begin to love God, if you begin to love what actually pleases Him, if you love His will being done in your life if you love his people, if you love people who are like him and his kingdom and his will for your life, if you love all these things more than you love yourself, then conversion is taking place in your heart. You see, believing in Jesus in your head leads to loving God with your heart. Number three, conversion. Your calendar needs converting. What? <laughs> Your calendar needs converting? Yeah, you see a change of mind and heart is usually made evident by a change in one's calendar. At first, the changes are small and they're pretty obvious. Sundays, you, know, you go to church when you didn't used to go to church. 
You even go to church on Sunday nights, why? Because you love God. Because you love His people. Because you love singing praise to Him. And then on Wednesday nights, all of a sudden, you know, Wednesday, they, they, we want to start a new bowling league. I don't know, you know so when, and we're doing it Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday, you know, we have a midweek service. I'm teaching a class or I'm helping out. I don't, yeah, you know, when you do it on Thursdays or Tuesdays, call me. Why? Because I love God more than I love bowling. That's why you wouldn't say it like that, but that's what you're really saying. But then we see ourselves you know, circling time each day for prayer, never mind Sunday. Each day I'm going to set aside a little bit of time, a little me time, me and God time. And then we find ourselves circling the calendar and making, you know, uh, making time to be with Christian friends and time to serve with others in the name of Christ. Yeah, I'd like to be with you guys on Friday and everything looks good, but I've said to so-and-so, I said to the youth minister that I'd go and help him out with the, with the youth thing over at the, you know, whatever church, you know, I'm committed on that night. I circled my calendar on that night. And then all of a sudden, you're not just kind of going along with other Christians or sitting in the pew listening to what others are saying and being directed by others who are leading you in singing. All of a sudden, you have a responsibility and you're leading others and they're listening to you teach, and they're listening to you pray, or they're listening to you as you say, okay guys, I need you over here, we're going to fix this door, I bought a door, we're going to put it in, Charlie can get some paint, you know, all of a sudden you're the guy, or the sister, that others are following, because you love God, and you're, calorying, you're, you're circling your calendar for more and more things that have to do with God. As the conversion process continues, we find that we have less time for ourselves, less time for worldly selfish pleasure, less time to advance our wealth and position in this world. I mean, it just have, nobody commands it. Nobody up here from the pulpit, is, you must, there's no must here. You do it because you want to do it. For some, the realization that we're losing control of our calendar as Christ begins to dominate our time, it sends a feeling of panic through our souls. <laughs> I remember when the, you know, there's a tipping point. You know, that, I remember when that tipping point happened in my life. You know, bef just before I went into ministry, you know, I think Lisa and I were talking, it's, you might as well go into ministry and get paid for it because that's all you're doing. <laughs> You've circled so much stuff on the calendar, there's barely enough time for you to go and do your regular job. And that's a panicky feeling. Because so long as I'm earning a living and I'm in control, I'm the boss of me. But then all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> the Lord's in boss of you. Some people react differently when that moment of panic, when that tipping point where the Lord is starting to you know, take up a lot of time there. Some people refuse, okay, that's enough, that's too much, and that's where they fall away. And some fight it and run themselves ragged, trying to keep two calendars going, theirs and God's. And then some borrow or use God's time for worship or service in order to get ahead on their work or their extra sleep, or simply catch up on worldly hobbies and pleasures. You see, what they don't realize is that they may be getting ahead in this world by using up God's time, but they do it at the expense of their own spiritual lives. We may end up making a little more money or getting a better grade on that test, but in sacrificing our spiritual life to do so, we lose whatever benefit we may have received from God during that time. We also clearly demonstrate to others and to the church and to the Lord Himself what our priorities are. It's always evident. Of course, others accept the shift from a worldly-based schedule to a kingdom-based schedule and the peace of mind and security that that brings. You know, time is precious because it measures our life. 
To convert our calendar to Christ is in essence to give Him our life. Because our life is measured by our calendar. And then you know, you've got the head, the heart, the calendar. The fourth area, cash conversion. Cash conversion. It is said that when the Emperor Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, was converted to Christianity, he ordered all of his armies to be baptized in order to follow his lead. And when his men were immersed in the water, they allowed themselves to go under, but they held their swords above the water to signify that their weapons would still be in their control. You know, a lot of people today, they do the same thing when they're baptized, except that what they're holding up above the water is their wallets. Yeah, I want to follow Jesus, but I don't want to get my wallet wet. <laughs> Letting Christ control our minds and hearts and time is one thing, but money, we like to be the ones who control that. The Jews were taught early by God that 100% of what they owned belonged to Him. And He allowed them to keep up to 90% of it if they honored Him with the first 10%. We mistakenly think that we own our stuff. We control our money and we give God a small token of our stuff to say thank you. Oh boy, that is so, so theologically warped. We don't own anything. It's all His. Nothing has changed. 3,500 years from the time that God originally taught this idea to Moses and the Jews, the principle remains the same. It's all His stuff. Conversion means that we give back to God what rightfully belongs to Him the rightful ownership of everything we possess. Conversion means that we acknowledge His rightful ownership by giving Him a generous, and that's 10% plus, by giving Him a generous first portion of all that He has allowed us to have. You remember in the Old Testament, right? We, you see that 10%? That 10% wasn't even considered giving. That 10% was a tax. It was owed to God. You owe me 10%. We'll talk about what you want to offer as an offering later, but first we'll start with 10% off the top. And then you had to pay for the firstborn. That was also a tax. You weren't doing them a favor. You were just paying taxes. And then after you did your 10% and your firstborn offering, so on and so forth, then if you wanted to make an offering, yeah, that part counted as something that you actually giving to God. And then you were holy and com completely devoted to Him. If then you offer, on top of all of this, if you offered Him something that you lost complete control of. In other words, for that third offering, you could bring a, a bull and say, I'm going to offer a bull to the Lord. And instead, you could exchange it and give the value of the bull in exchange to God. As an offering, you keep the bull, right? Because you need it. And you, you get to use it. But when you gave a, whole, a holy offering to God, then you gave the bull and the priest killed it and burned it completely. You had no recourse to it anymore. You lost the value of it. The, uh, the, 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 um, the face value of the animal, you lost that, and you also lost everything that you could have profited from that animal in the future. So we're, we're mistaken, brothers and sisters, you know, all the brothers out there, when we get up and we talk about the, the, uh, you know, the offering, we often hear some brothers saying, and now we're going to give a little bit back to the Lord, you know, uh, 10 percent. Well, that's, yeah. We own that. We own that. Conversion means that we acknowledge His rightful ownership by giving Him a percentage, a first percentage of what we have. We are saying to Him, dear God, you own everything. Everything I have is yours. Let me please give you 
the first fruit of what I have. That's the right mindset. The cash conversion in our lives is not really about money. It's about using money to show that we no longer trust money to sustain us. We trust God to sustain us. As my giving increases, what really increases is that my faith and trust resides in God and not in my bank balance. That's the point of giving. That's the point of increasing our giving. This isn't a sermon about giving. I'm just saying to you, how does one relate to the other? How does giving relate to conversion? The more we give, yes, we're generous, that's fine and good. The more the church can do, yes. But the more we give, what we're saying to God is, God, I rely on you and not this. Now, the reason for the teaching, the preaching, the lessons, you know, the reason for the indoctrination is not just that we know a lot about religious stuff, the purpose of indoctrination is conversion. And conversion or change must work in four areas if it is to be complete, as I said. A change of mind. We hear and understand and believe as true what God says to us in His word. And we believe the positive things and the negative things. We believe that those who are in Christ will go to heaven and be with Him forever. We believe that is true, but also conversely, we believe that those who are not in Christ will not have that reward. That is also true. Conversion requires, as I said, a change of heart. We confess our faith without shame. We repent and change our ways. We are baptized to bury the old sinful man and to raise a new and loving man or woman. Conversion requires a change of calendar. <coughs> Excuse me. Our time is at God's disposal and what we want is to be faithful to Him regardless of how much or little time that we have. Borrowing His time to advance us in this world does not advance us in the kingdom. And that's really what it's all about. And then of course, a change in our giving. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because a cheerful giver is a converted giver. And you know what? I'm not just talking about money in the plate. We have dozens of ways of giving throughout the week. We give our time, we give our attention, we give our love, we give our patience, we give all those things. You can only give your money cheerfully if you've already given your head and heart and calendar to the Lord. If you've given the first time, the money follows easily and naturally, even cheerfully. But if your heart isn't right and your time is still your own, you won't part happily with money either. That's how it works. Most of us here today have been indoctrinated, but have we been converted? Some may need to begin the process by honest Bible study or by being baptized. Others may be stuck in the middle of the process, refusing to change your heart or calendar or wallets. These people need to pray to Jesus to help them give up and allow Him to take, uh, to take over certain areas of their lives. And the point that I really want to make here God asks this of us not to punish us or to make our lives less joyful. It's exactly the opposite. It's where we find joy. It's where we find peace. It's where we find security. The more we give ourselves to Him, the more we find peace of mind. That's what He means by you know, a peace that surpasses understanding. The guy who's got Peace because of understanding. He's the guy that's got a million bucks in the bank. I know why I feel good. I got a million bucks in the bank. But the peace that surpasses understanding, yeah. That's the guy who hasn't got a million bucks in the bank. That's a guy who's given, he's given his all to the Lord and yet what happens? He feels secure. He believes the promises. She knows 
that God will never ever lie to her and therefore finds ways to give herself to the Lord each and every day. So I ask tonight, ask yourselves, what part of me has not yet been converted? And give that part to the Lord. Well, we're going to sing a song as, our, as is our custom here to encourage you to think about your response to this lesson whether it be a, response, a public response, come forward, be baptized, come forward, ask for prayer, or even a private response. Yes, Lord, when I go home tonight, I'm going to take a time of prayer and I'm going to talk about my heart conversion or my head conversion. That's a response too. We're not the only witnesses here. God and the angels also witnessing what's taking place. So if you need to make a response, make that decision now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.